geht, willkommen zu einer neuen Folge auf dem DNX Podcast. Was ihr jetzt gleich hört, ist ein Instagram Live, das wir bei uns auf den Instagram Kanälen gestreamt haben. Folgt uns auf Instagram unter unseren alten Namen Markus Meurer 95 und Felicia Hagarten. Und jetzt viel Spaß mit der Folge. One more time. Uh, ah, you now I see you. Yeah, now I got you. Now I got right. you. I don't, I don't know what's going on. Um, so I yeah, like I was yet. like I was saying, I was uh, in the army for a while. Uh, built and sold uh, two tech companies. Uh, ran some product and growth teams at a uh, Facebook, Snapchat, and uh, been investing for the last five years. Uh, we've invested uh, like over, I think, uh, yeah, over a hundred million dollars in the last five years on early stage tech companies, and uh, pretty bullish on Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, that's great to hear. Same for me. So, um, what are your thoughts about the current financial system? What's happening now since the beginning of the year, and especially since three or four weeks? Yeah. So obviously, uh, the virus has um, kind of driven this. Uh, you know, government mandated shutdown across economies uh, that then has led to this economic crisis. Uh, that economic crisis um, kind of initially got started with a liquidity crisis or a liquidity trap. Everyone looked around and said, holy shit, I need dollars. Um, and so they sold anything that they possibly had in their portfolio that had a liquid market. So there was, you know, stocks, treasuries, Bitcoin, gold, whatever it was. Um, and, uh, and that kind of shook a lot of people out. A lot of markets kind of gyrated there. Um, and now we're sitting here uh, and you're getting some dislocation where, uh, you know, especially the U.S. stock market, uh, literally stocks are going up and more and more people are losing their jobs and more businesses are shutting down. And so uh, what it reminds us is the stock market isn't necessarily a, um, a representation of the economy. It's a representation of central bank activities uh, and the central banks are printing ungodly amount of money, um, literally mm -hmm. trillions of dollars. Uh, my thought process is um, I'm, I probably am not in the camp of thinking we're going to get any hyperinflation or even high levels of inflation. Uh, I think we're in a pretty deflationary environment that will eat up a lot of liquidity. Um, but, but ultimately, I think it'll be very, very bullish for Bitcoin um, over the next 18 months or so. How could that happen that the Federal Reserve is printing money with the quantitative easing programs and, and the money is not getting to the people and uh, in the paradox way? the stock market is, is also like uh, regaining traction and, and going higher and higher, um, even though people are losing their jobs. So what's wrong with the system? Yeah, so, so I think that there's two pieces to this. The first is uh, absolutely the quantitative easing is not getting to the people. Right here in the United States, the most you could get uh, was $1,200 bucks, um, in the stimulus packages. And then there were some additions to the unemployment um, packages that people could also get. But majority of that capital was going to business owners uh, and to uh, various markets, um, you know, and, and large corporations, things like that. So you, you got to remember that the quantitative easing is not being given to people and therefore it gets soaked up, right? So we go and we bail out a, uh, a, a company, but that company doesn't necessarily then give the money to its employees who then go spend on economic activity. Instead, what ends up happening is they literally just hold on to it, right? Um, so I think or that's rebuying. Kind of rebuying their own shares, you know, and driving all, their all their kinds price. of dumb stuff. Yeah, they're doing all kinds of stuff. So I think that that's one piece of it. The other piece of it is um, we're in such a deflationary environment, right? I mean, the dollar just continues to strengthen asset prices continue to sell off. And so what you get is um, think of it almost as like uh, it's digging a hole, right? And you could fill up that hole with a lot of water, but it can take the water because the hole's so deep, right? It's such a deflationary environment that it can suck up that liquidity. And so what it's going to force them to do is keep pumping more and more and more and more. Uh, we're already at, I don't know, 2.6 trillion or something like that in the US just in, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, I think that they're going to have to do at least 5 trillion. That's what I've been saying from, uh, from early on. Um, and uh, if they do 5 trillion, that means that they'll have more than doubled the Fed's balance sheet uh, throughout this thing. Um, and we'll have a hot, uh, more than $10 trillion Fed balance sheet Uh, which is just wild to think about, but, uh, but I think it's that's crazy. Where we're mm -hmm. So what do you think? When will this end or how could this end? Well, the, the number one way to solve the economic crisis is turn the economy back on, get people back to work. Right. Um, and, and, and I fully understand that there's the virus. You got to do it in a safe and intelligent way. But it, from a pure economic standpoint, Hey, the economy is suffering. Why is the economy suffering? Because we shut all the businesses down. Okay, well, what happens if we turn them back on? Well, the economy will restart and it won't go back, you know, immediately to where it was, but at least we can go on that path to getting there. So you got to start the economy back up, but you also have to balance that with doing it in a safe and intelligent way because of the virus. But would you be with me that um, this was unavoidable uh, anyway, even without the, the virus, which just accelerated um, this, this happenings in the last weeks? 
Absolutely. Yeah. Look, a lot of the structural issues that we're seeing kind of happen, people were, were talking about. I mean, last summer, uh, you know, I was writing about uh, all kinds of things, everything from, uh, you know, CEOs were all leaving to uh, over leveraged companies to the debt fueled uh, stock buybacks. Uh, to the credit markets. Remember back in like, you know, Q3 of last year uh, when the repo markets, they're like, oh, this is a temporary measure. Well, now they're doing hundreds of billions of dollars, right? So like, the overnight, come on. The overnight repos, huh? <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, just, it's just crazy stuff, right? And so I, I think that, um, yes, the virus definitely accelerated it and probably made it way worse than it would have been otherwise. But at the end of the yeah. day, these problems were there. They were very easy to, uh, to um, identify and, and the alarms were going off. But do you, do you think um, the Federal Reserve has any more tools than these quantitative easing or helicopter money they are doing now? And how long will this work? So could, could, could it be like that they get the turn and everything will get to normal and the dollar will stabilize? Yeah, so they definitely have, uh, I, I joke and I say they've got no more tools, right? But they got more bullets, right? And what I mean by that is uh, they basically had two guns to pull out, right? And the first gun uh, is kind of, think of it as like a regular rifle, which is they can manipulate the interest rates, right? And they kind of shot all of their bullets. They got one bullet left in the chamber though. And that's, they can go negative interest rates. So we're at zero, they could go negative. And, and I think that they will end up going negative, but we got one bullet left in that chamber of that gun. The other weapon that they have is they've got a bazooka, right? Which is quantitative easing. So we got a rifle and we got a bazooka and that bazooka, I mean, we've been firing it away. <laughs> we've been firing <laughs> of dollars, but, uh, but, but they could always do more, right? So it wouldn't surprise me to, again, to see kind of a total of five trillion or more when it's all said and done. Um, so they can print more. Uh, and so I think that we kind of got a couple of bullets left, but there are no other tools, right? There, there's nothing else that the Fed can do um, other than continue to manipulate interest rates farther down and also to print more money. Um, so I think that they'll, they'll just do what the only tools that they have. So what I really liked in your interview with uh, Robert Kiyosaki from uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Uh, by the way, amazing interview, amazing energy from Robert, right? <laughs> I really loved it. So you were talking about the Fed and, and uh, just clarifying the myth that the, the Fed is not federal. The Fed doesn't have a reserve. And I forgot the third one. Maybe you can yeah, repeat. And, uh, well, the Fed's not uh, federal. It's not, uh, ha doesn't have a reserve and it's not a bank, right? It's called the, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, All right. and, and so I, I think people got to just remember, um, you know, look, the, I, I continue to say it, the virus has exposed all the shams in society. Yeah. That's it. Right. And, and, uh, and by the way, that doesn't mean that they're going to change. It just means that more people know their shams, right? Because everyone knew it was a sham before, or, or, or a good amount of people knew it was a sham before. Um, but now I think just more people understand that, uh, I don't think there's gonna be a lot of change, um, which is unfortunate, but, uh, but, but that's really what's happened here. What do you think about the recovering of Bitcoin? I think Bitcoin is the first asset who recovered like fully from, from the Corona um, happening some weeks ago. So did you expect it first that it would like go down that deep and then recover that quick? Yeah, so a couple of pieces to this. The first is uh, in a liquidity crisis, all correlations go towards one, meaning that everyone wants dollars and everything sells off, right? And uh, we saw it with stocks, bonds, Gold, Bitcoin, you know, everything, right? Um, Bitcoin is hyper volatile. And so in that scenario, Bitcoin, when it appreciates, appreciates more than everything. When it goes down, it goes down more than everything. So it went down 50% in a single day, ended up down like 35, 30%, whatever for that, uh, that day. Um, and what we've seen is a full recovery to kind of pre-COVID levels already, right? Now, yeah. I definitely did not expect it was going to go down 50%. I don't think anyone expected that. Anyone who said that's full of shit. Uh, but, but I think that now what we end up being is in a situation where um, on the recovery, that volatility should work in Bitcoin's favor as well, right? And so we should actually end up seeing um, a, a pretty substantial increase in US dollar price from here. Mm, let's talk a little bit about the halving because I think this also plays an important role, which is coming up in some weeks. Maybe you can explain for my audience who is not all crypto like crypto uh, fanatics, but they are at least very open minded. And, and I talk a lot about crypto. So maybe you can talk a little bit about the halving and what you're expecting about it. Yeah. So the, uh, the halving essentially is um, every four years, the amount of Bitcoin coming into the system gets cut in half. Um, so in, uh, 2008, 2009, or really 2009, uh, 50 Bitcoin every 10 minutes, uh, was delivered, uh, to the market that happened for four years and then went from 50 to 25 
uh, after four years of 25 every 10 minutes and then got cut to 12 and a half, which it is at today. Uh, and in May of this year, literally probably 20 days or so, um, we're going to see that cut from 12 and a half to 6.25. Uh, and so in the gold world, for example, imagine if 50% of the gold miners shut down, right? 50% of the incoming supply on a daily basis goes away. Uh, so there's the supply shock, um, which basically decreases the amount of uh, incoming Bitcoin. Um, at the same time, what's uh, exciting to me around Bitcoin is uh, there's also likely to be this demand shock, right? We see all this printing of money. Uh, we see currencies failing Lebanon right now. Uh, their currency is actually in the middle of failing and uh, Bitcoin trading at $15,000 of Bitcoin in Lebanon um, because uh, people want to just get out of their, their core currency. Um, and, and so I think that when you get a demand shock and a supply shock at the same time, uh, plus you have um, the, the kind of having in the macro backdrop, I think we're going to see a pretty uh, significant uh, increase in U.S. dollar value. So many people are always asking when is the best time to buy Bitcoin? Uh, and then like the legendary question is, is it too late now? What, what would you answer to this question? Yeah. So uh, short answer, I don't know. Um, you know, I, I definitely don't give any financial advice. Everyone's got to kind of do their own research and all that kind of stuff. And basically I'm an idiot, so don't listen to me. Uh, but, but uh, <laughs> on top of that, I really think of it as two things. So one is when you look at um, the, the history time in the market is actually more important than timing the market. Right. And what that basically means is the longer you've been in the market, the more likely you are to have exposure to the days when Bitcoin increases by substantial value. So in 2017, for example, Bitcoin 20 X. Right. Um, and, and people are like, oh, my God, that's crazy. Well, that 20 X was almost entirely done when you combine the nine biggest days of the year. So unless you're a fantastic trader, you are unlikely to have been in the market just those nine days and not the other ones. And so what ends up occurring is Bitcoin has appreciated, I think it's at like 30 or 35 percent annualized returns. Like the compound annual growth rate of Bitcoin from a return basis is like 30 or 35 percent over a decade. It's incredible, right? That literally, if that was a hedge fund, would be one of the top five hedge funds in the world. Right. And you and, and you would have been invested in it. And so I think that people just got to realize, like, using traditional investment strategies that are, are sound principles like dollar cost averaging and things like that um, are, are super valuable here. And I think it will end up if Bitcoin works, which is still, um, you know, there's some risk that it doesn't. But but if it works, you'll, you'll end up uh, being pretty happy, I think. Totally. And talking about the compound effect, what do you think about the decentralized slash centralized um finance platforms like BlockFi or Crypto.com, uh, I think, which is very attractive for many people, um, which now find out about putting their stable coins still being more or less in cash and uh, getting some interest on this. Yeah, so we're, we're, uh, we're big investors in BlockFi. Um, li literally have given them, uh, you know, what is it? Uh, eight figures of money. So more than $10 million. Um, and uh, we're, we're very big investors there, uh, big believers. Uh, we all use the product ourselves, um, have, um, you know, pretty significant, um, you know, uh, kind of belief that that business is going to, uh, to continue to grow and, and do very well. And ultimately, it's because we're bringing traditional financial services that you see in the legacy world to uh, Bitcoin and crypto. Right. And so, so I think that is uh, kind of our, our belief there uh, in terms of DeFi. Like, first of all, Bitcoin is DeFi. Right. It is. Oh, excuse me. It, it's the ultimate DeFi. It's literally a decentralized currency. Um, on top of that, though, I, I think that the decentralized uh, financial services are going to be um, really important uh, in the future. It's, the big question is just where do they get built? Do they get built on, um, you know, something like a uh, Ethereum? Do they get built on Bitcoin? Um, all, all kinds of different uh, options there. Okay, someone is asking about uh, Crypto.com because I'm also um, a user of Crypto.com. I love them a lot. What do you think about Crypto.com? Yeah, look, they're, they're sponsors of the podcast. Um, I, I really like the team over there. Um, I think they've done a great job continuing to release product after product after product. Uh, and they definitely got good advertising campaigns. I don't know if you guys saw the uh, a lot of the things that they did in San Francisco and L.A. and stuff where um, they had these huge London. billboards like, you know, Plan, time for plan B or uh, the $22 trillion money printer never shuts off and all this kind of stuff. So, uh, so, 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 um, big fans of the team there. 
Right. And someone is asking a question. And uh, before that, many people were also approaching me when they found out uh, you on the podcast. What do you think about Chainlink? It's more or less like uh, the shooting star at the moment. Yeah. Um, so I've done an interview with uh, Sergey. Uh, he came on the podcast. It's probably been over a year now. Um, but uh, the two things I said to him, I said, hey, uh, this might be one of the most engaged audiences I've seen in crypto um with the uh what is it the chain link marines i think uh and uh and they definitely were uh were going wild um when uh, when we did the interview and the second thing is um you know and this is kind of my answer it's a little cookie cutter for a lot of this stuff but the end solution that they're building is needed right somebody's got to build that um the question becomes where does it get built right and so should you build it on a bitcoin Should you build mm -hmm. it on Chainlink? Should you build it somewhere else? Should you integrate that stuff, right? There, there, there's no clear answer here yet. And, and part of the beauty of crypto is uh, we should encourage the innovation. We should encourage the experimentation that people have um, and, and let them go all do this and let the best person win, right? Let the best project win. Let the market decide. Like, who cares what I think, right? It's kind of my, my answer um, because ultimately I don't know. And, and I think that, Chainlink's a great example that there's a number of others where people are, uh, are are essentially doing this. So let's see what happens. What do you think how long will it take to really get the mass adoption and all the projects and all the startups you're also funding with your with your fund um, will prosper? And, and is it just a tipping point? Are we that close or could it take a longer journey? Yeah, look, I, I, um, I, I look back and I say, uh, A lot of people like to say, hey, we're in the uh, you know, mid-90s of the internet, right? I say maybe, but if you go back to the internet when it really started, you used to have to type in the IP address, right? So you couldn't even type in a URL. Well, think of like Bitcoin wallets, for example. Right now, we're using these hex addresses. People are going to look back on that you know, 20 years from now and be like, Can you imagine typing this in and triple yeah. checking it and like your stomach drops every time you send Bitcoin to someone because you're scared you're going to mess up, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so like that is a perfect example of how early a lot of this stuff is. Um, and so I, I always use this framework with, uh, with our founders where I call it urgent patience, right? On a day-to-day -day basis, you have to have a sense of urgency. You got to get things done. You got to push the pace, right? And you really got to work hard. At the same time, On a more macro level, you got to have patience. You got to understand where you are in the process, or right? you got to understand that Bitcoin is a 20, 30, 40, 50 year type idea. This is going to take decades to go where we think it's going to go. That doesn't change the fact that on every single day we got to have a sense of urgency to get shit done. It's just also we got to then have the confidence and the discipline and patience to realize let's not you know freak out because this year we didn't get a hundred million people to, to enter bitcoin right it's gonna take time everyone chill out um what do you think is your estimation how many people are already involved in the crypto and bitcoin space uh between 50 and 100 million um uh, pro okay. probably it's probably somewhere like the 70 75 million is uh at least the numbers that i've seen recently all right mm, so there, bad, there's a lot of It's not bad, but there's still a lot of room to grow when you when you think about it. Of course. I think not, not every millionaire on this planet can own one Bitcoin. That's a crazy number, right? Of course. And, and if you think about, if, let's say it's 70 million, give or take. It's about 1% of the world's population, right? Mm -hmm. It's about 1%. That means 99% of the world's population owns no Bitcoin. Um, how many of your percentage of your net worth is in crypto or on Bitcoin? Um, I haven't looked recently, but, uh, but, but definitely I am, uh, probably, uh, infamous now. So I, cause I don't know if it's a good thing or not, but I took 50% of my net worth at one point, uh, and, and, uh, bought Bitcoin and Bitcoin only. Um, and, and so, uh, ha have not sold if anything, I've bought more. Um, and so I have no clue what the percentage is today, but, uh, but it's a big, <laughs> it's a really big percentage. So you're really bullish on Bitcoin and this is what I love about you because I'm also a big, big, big believer in, in, in this whole new technology. And if you see the evolution of like mankind and technology, it just makes too much sense not to be successful. Yeah. And, and look, I, I tell people a lot. Uh, well, two things. One is you 
you can have opinions, but ultimately the best way to evaluate what somebody's doing is look to see what they're actually doing, right? And what they really believe. So I, I recently did an interview on the podcast, um, this guy, uh, Jahan Bose Little. Um, Jahan's a good friend of mine. Uh, he was uh, previously at Goldman in their credit trading division. He ran a multi-billion dollar book uh, to trade uh, during the subprime uh, crisis, right? So he was like literally in the thick of it, trading the assets that, that were uh, being um, kind of uh, impacted the most. And he always talks about it as when I call up my trader friends, I don't ask them what they think. I tell them to tell me their portfolio. That's all I need mm. to know, right? Yeah. How long are you? How big is the position, right? How much leverage do you have on that position? How short are you? How long ago did you sell? How much did you sell? Those are the things you need to know. And once you know those things, then you know how somebody thinks. Yeah, amazing. Um, so what do you think about going back to the gold standard? Is it, is it really like something what is realistic? Because I think if we would have talked about it one year ago, everybody would be like, you're crazy. And now it starts popping up and people just yeah, pinging this idea. I don't think we're going back. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk of people saying, Hey, we can just, uh, you know, repeg to gold. I, I just don't see it happening. It, it's like saying to, uh, it, it's like telling a drug dealer, Hey, I'm addicted to drugs. Stop selling me drugs. Right. The drug dealer says, that's great, man. But like, that's how I make money. <laughs> right? and, and so it's like federal reserve, same thing. Like, Hey guys, we're going to take away your power to print money. They're like, fuck no, right? Why, why would I ever agree to that? Um, so, so I don't think that's going to happen. So I think people got to protect themselves, right? Obviously, I'm super bullish on, uh, on Bitcoin specifically. Um, and uh, I think that's kind of the solution, or at least the solution I've chosen for myself. So are you only in Bitcoin or do you also allocate um, your crypto wealth and other coins? Just got Bitcoin, man. I'm, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm in, again, right? It's kind of a, uh, go back to what I just said. You want to know what I think about everything? Ask me what I own, right? And it's I own Bitcoin. Um, with that said, uh, I think it's important for people to understand um, two pieces. One is that doesn't necessarily mean that I, uh, I don't believe in the other things, right? Um, I, I, uh, I think that that experimentation is really important. And I'm kind of in a wait and see on everything else, right? So I, I've got a lot of confidence in Bitcoin. Other things are interesting, but like, let's see what happens there before I, I kind of gain confidence in them. Um, and, and then the other piece is like, I obviously have a high percentage of my net worth in, uh, in Bitcoin, uh, but people usually don't ask what I do with the rest of uh, my net worth, right? And that's mostly in cash and real estate um, for the most part. And so when you look at it that way, it's like, I got a barbell strategy, right? I got some really, really risky assets and I got some super, super safe assets. When you talk about cash, is it a stable coin or is it, or is it cash, cash in the bank? No, like U.S. dollars in the bank. All right. What do you think about like the the stablecoin thing that it's like prospering so much and accelerating at this moment? Do you think these are people who are sitting at the sideline and, and waiting for for the next big move, or what's going on there? I, I think people want to use the technology and they're going to want to do it in a stable manner, right? Bitcoin's obviously not stable today; it's super volatile. Yeah, I mm -hmm. think that over time that volatility will go down, but but. Um, The, the short-term need of a stable transfer of value makes a ton of sense for, um, uh, for stable coins. And that's why you're seeing a lot of people come out with them, uh, everyone from private companies to startups to uh, nation states, right? And I think that's just kind of a natural progression here. All right. Someone is asking, what, what are your thoughts about Robinhood for buying Bitcoin? You use different exchanges, had a terrible experience with Robinhood. Do you yeah. Have any red I flags? I've never used uh, Robinhood, so I, I can't speak to them specifically. What I would say is, um, you know, for most people, the rule of thumb is like, just use large companies that are reputable, right? Uh, so like, if you go off into the, you know, the woods of the internet, and you start using some service that you've never heard of before, like, eh, it's a little risky, right? Instead, if you go use the, the companies that you've heard of, Uh, and that have millions of users, you're probably likely to be more safe there, right? So um, it, it's, uh, you know, if you look at um, everything from, uh, let's see, uh, Coinbase, Kraken, Gemini, Cash App, BlockFi, Robinhood, eToro, right? I mean, you just go down the line, like all of these different companies um, are, are, uh, are pretty reputable, pretty well known, got a lot of users. And so that's what I would uh, focus on. Amazing. Someone's asking, what's your opinion on Raul Paul moving to 
25% Bitcoin in his portfolio. Oh, is he 25% Bitcoin now? Yeah, so someone said, Stockpile said it. <laughs> okay, I, I, ha so, I haven't seen that. So I, I know that he is, uh, he's pretty bullish on Bitcoin. Uh, now that I, if, he, if he's at 25%, when we get off this thing, I'm going to text him and I'm going to, uh, to make fun of him and tell him that uh, he's only halfway to, uh, to, to me and he's got to step his game up. <laughs> Amazing. No, but look, Ra Ra Raul, is, Raul is very, very smart. Um, I, I think that uh, Raul is um, one of the few people who's spent a lot of time um, going through various um, crises. He really understands this stuff. And uh, I, I think that um, right now, last I heard, he was long Bitcoin, long dollars uh, for the most part. And uh, I think that that'll probably end up being pretty a uh, pretty good trade for him. What do you think about Robert Kiyosaki that he also made the turn to Bitcoin now and uh, more or less a little bit regretting that he wasn't or didn't understand the game so early? Yeah, look, I, he, he was pretty clear with me that he said, look, I, I, I don't invest in things I don't understand. I didn't understand. I didn't do the work, right? Then once he did the work, he said, oh, wow, this is really powerful. And I think he says, you know, gold and silver, he looks at as God's money and Bitcoin as the people's money, right? And I think that's a pretty fair way to look at it. And so... Uh, um, you know, I'm not one of these people who holds it against uh, the folks who are anti Bitcoin. Uh, I actually want them to kind of see the light and to, to recognize the value it has. And so when they cross over, uh, I, I'm uh, not only one appreciative, but two also uh, very welcoming of them. All right. Stockpile is asking why, why do you have your cash in the bank instead of 8.66 APY and BlockFi? Yeah. I, I um I've got some USD. Uh, I think it's either GUSD or USDC. I can't remember. Um, that that's no in tether. there. Yeah, uh, I think they only support. Don't own tether. I, I think they only support GUSD and USDC. Um, so I have okay. some in there. Um, but but uh, the the big thing for me is uh, I uh, a long time ago, many years ago, uh, basically made a decision. There was a certain amount of money that I wanted to keep uh, in cash and never invest, never touch, and and so um, that's what I do. Right. Pump, I know, I know you're short on time. Maybe some last uh, personal question. Um, do you have Greek roots because your, your name is like Pompliano or something like this? I, I never found out, but uh, you, you speak very native and live in New York. So what are your yeah. roots? Where are you coming from? Uh, my entire family, for the most part, is from um, Italy. So uh, oh. the, um, Sorry. Uh, let's see, three of my grandparents um are italian one of them is half italian half cuban uh and he was born or i'm sorry no he no he's he's from cuba my mother is half italian half cuban um so uh kind of 75 percent italian 25 percent cuban at my grandparents uh and then um it, the part of italy uh is a place called abruzzo uh, abruzzo is basically in kind of the central east part of uh, of italy um very much kind of like uh, in the countryside all right Why do you live in New York? It's the epicenter of the world, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I've got a, uh, I, I got uh, my wife here, and um, and we live here in New York, and uh, we love it. So it's, uh, uh, you know, maybe some point we'll move somewhere, but uh, for now, I, I don't know where else we would go. So we uh, we we tend to uh, travel quite a bit. Got friends, obviously, all over the world, and we enjoy going to do that, but. Uh, We're, we're some of those people that, uh, you know, after a week or two, I'm like, all right, let, let's go back home. And, and when we think of that, it's New York. So, uh, so we stay here. Do you have a personal opinion about all this virus stuff? Is it like a cover up? Is it man made? What's going on in the world? Wash your hands, stay inside, drink some vitamin C, and let's open up the economy. <laughs> That's basically yeah. my opinion. I, I mean, look, I, I hear all the conspiracy theories, all the stuff like, You know, I, I am very, very, um, you know, kind of forthright in public about my ideas of uh, we're definitely not being told the truth about anything, right? I, I mean, the, the manipulation of media and the spread of fake news and all stuff is uh, rampant, especially in the United States, but, but globally as well. Uh, it, it's example after example after example of that um, kind of being proven. Uh, I tend to think that um, you know, for, uh, for the virus specifically, uh, th there's a lot of things that, um, you know, are going to end up being disproven over time. But if we're going to, uh, have a reaction to something like this, we should overreact rather than underreact. Um, and so we did that. 
and, and now we should start working towards a, a solution that uh, can reopen the economy. Uh, but also at the same time, we've got to be smart and intelligent about how we address the virus as well, right? So it doesn't have to be a black and white solution. We can kind of um, address both at the same time. Amazing. How much time do you spend on working on your podcast? I saw recently you were just publishing one episode after the other. You were like featured on the front page of, of iTunes. Uh, so well done for this. And yeah, how important is your podcast for you? Uh, to be honest, I enjoy it. Like here's what people should know is when I release an episode, it's basically me saying I learned something, right? So like that's why I do the podcast and, and I make no uh, kind of secret about it. It's super selfish of me to do that podcast. And the reason is because I can call up pretty much anybody and say, hey, I want to interview you. Will you come on um, and, and do this interview? Uh, I will take your message that you say to me and I will show it to hundreds of thousands of people. Right. And uh, and that gets a lot of people to say yes. And so then I get to have conversations with these people, ask them the questions that I'm interested in. And it just so happens that I record the conversation and other people think it's valuable as well. But like. For me, the value is I get to talk to these people. I get to learn, um, you know, what uh, what these people are, are thinking, um, and, and so it's super valuable. Do you own any stocks? Uh, the only stocks I own, I, I used to say no, but then somebody corrected me and said uh, my entire retirement account is in uh, GBTC. Um, but but uh, that's the only stock, and I, I don't even. I, I think most people don't even consider that a real stock. Um, it's. Uh, You know, the, the whole public markets are, um, they're great. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people really enjoy uh, investing in public companies. Uh, I don't feel like I've got a competitive advantage there. Uh, I don't feel like I know something other people don't know. Uh, and on top of that, I also don't think that um, there is really, um, you know, uh, kind of outsized returns um, in the stock market compared to other things that I have access to. Mm, are you in touch with... Um... Peter Schiff sometimes, uh, other than on your podcast, and <laughs> do you text each other? Yeah, we, we email with each other. Yeah, P Peter's <laughs> great. I, I uh, Peter's great. He's doing a great job for the crypto world, right? Look, and, and uh, don't forget, right? Um, every person you see publicly creating content, doing all this stuff, you got to remember there's an element of we're all entertainers, right? He's entertaining. I'm entertaining. Yes, we are all, you know, uh, kind of educating and doing this stuff, but there's also an element of the entertainment. He gets that entertainment game better than most. And so uh, you just keep that in the back of your head. And, and uh, when you look at it from that light, he's a super smart guy. Uh, he's been very, very right about a lot of problems in the economy. Um, and then he's got an entertainment flair to him, which I appreciate. And how much do you work on your in your venture fund? Um, are you operatively also doing some stuff or... Do you have like a management team and you're more or less just a founder, co-founder? Yeah. So, so I've got, um, two partners, um, uh, Jason Williams and Mark Yusko. Uh, they're, they're fantastic. Um, and the three of us are, um, you know, kind of the decision makers and, and, and do the bulk of the work. Uh, we also have some other help. Um, there's a, a gentleman Om Patel who helps us, um, and, and a couple of other people, um, especially on the operational side and, and the compliance side and things like that. And so I think that, uh, you know, we're in a pretty, um, pretty unique position um, to, to, uh, to manage that capital. And, and we take that responsibility seriously and, and put quite a bit of time into it. Do you also personally listen to podcasts? And if yes, which is your favorite podcast? Yeah. Um, so I, I listen to some podcasts. Uh, let me, no particular order, um, but the ones that I listen to uh, are um, Joe Rogan, Eric Weinstein, um, Patrick O'Shaughnessy's Invest Like the Best. Uh, I've listened to some episodes of uh, Tales of the Crypt. Um, I, I really enjoy those. Um, I'm trying to think. Those are probably Tim Ferriss uh, I listen to. Um, so yeah, yeah, I'd say those are like the main ones um, that, uh, that, that I do. And, and I really like the really long form. Like uh, if anyone hasn't heard, um, Pauline actually told me about this one. Uh, there's a uh, interview that Jocko Wilnick, uh, that's another one that I've listened to a couple times, uh, he did with this guy, Johnny Kim, uh, who's a former Navy SEAL. He's a trained Harvard uh, doctor, and now he is a NASA astronaut. Uh, it's like a four and a half hour podcast uh, all about Johnny's life and, and uh, kind of his view of the world, um, and it's pretty special. So, uh, so things like that I think are really cool. Amazing, Tom. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> 
And thank you again for everything you're doing for the crypto space. And yeah, keep up the good job. Thank you so yeah, much. No, listen, thank you so much for putting this together. Um, I, uh, I appreciate it and uh, happy to do it again in the future. Yeah. See you. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Talk soon. Talk soon. Bye. Yes, yes, yo. Was für eine epische Folge. Danke fürs Zuhören. Und wenn dir die Folge gefallen hat, dann teile sie auch gerne mit deinen Freunden und gib uns eine Bewertung auf iTunes. Wir beide, Yara Joy und ich, teilen unser Leben regelmäßig auf Instagram, in den Stories, machen auch immer wieder Insta-Lives und folge uns da auf jeden Fall. Das Profil von Yara Joy findest du unter Felicia Hagarten und mein Profil findest du unter Sonic Blue. Und last but not least, komm in die kostenlose DNX Facebook-Gruppe, die findest du auf Facebook unter DNX Community mit über 20.000 Mitgliedern. Wir beide sind am Start und helfen, wo wir können. That's it, bis zum nächsten Mal. Peace and out.